Ensembling is the business of combining multiple models into one. The hope is that this gives you a model that is more than the sum of its parts. We're introducing it here in the context of tree models, and indeed training ensembles of trees is a popular way of doing machine learning. But it's important to note that ensembling can be done with any kind of model. The collection of models that you train is called the ensemble. And in the simplest form of ensembling, each model in the ensemble can be trained in isolation as you would normally train it. After you somehow trained a bunch of separate models, and you are given a new instance to predict for, you can simply ask each of the models in your ensemble to provide a prediction. And then all you need to do is to somehow combine these predictions into a single prediction. In classification, the simplest approach is to take a majority vote among the ensemble. In regression, the simplest approach is to average the outputs. In both cases, you can also take a weighted vote, perhaps giving greater weight to the predictions of models that have greater confidence, or to the predictions of those models that perform better on a held out validation set. A more complex approach is stacking. And we'll look at that as our first example of an ensembling method. Imagine that you have a simple data set and that you train three models on this data set. These could be any three models, for instance, the three different models we saw in the first lecture, three neural networks with different initializations, or three K and N models with different values of K. Each of them gives us a prediction for every instance in our data set. The simplest way to understand what stacking does is to think of it as taking these three new columns and adding them to our data set as new features. And on this new extended data set, we now train a fourth model. This model is the combiner. It takes both the original features and the predictions of the ensemble and uses them to make a prediction. And the combiner can learn to choose how to combine the expert advice of the original models. And it can even use the original features to learn which of the models in our ensemble to listen to in which part of the feature space. In general, the combiner is a simple low variance model like logistic regression. And if we use stacking in combination with differentiable models like neural networks, then the stacked model is also fully differentiable. So we could even fine tune it end to end by using backpropagation. Now this is all a little bit ad hoc. To get a better handle on exactly what we're trying to achieve with ensembling, we need to look back to bias and variance. And here's a little visual reminder. If we have many darts hitting close together, but far away from the bullseye, we have high bias. If the darts are spread out, but their average is somewhere around the bullseye, we have high variance. And it's important to remember that in this analogy, sampling a data set and training a model together counts as one dart. To get a second dart, we need a new data set to train a new model on, and that's not usually a luxury we have. So normally we can't be exactly sure whether our error is due to high bias or high variance, but with tricks like resampling the data, we can often get a pretty good idea. And we'll start with high variance models. We also call these unstable learners. They may get a good performance, but slight perturbations in the data can completely throw that performance off. These are the kinds of models that tend to show overfitting, like k-nearest neighbors regression with a low k value or a regression tree with no regularization. Bias and variance are only precisely defined for regression problems, but the basic intuition carries over to classification. An unstable learner is one that tends to overfit and that is therefore sensitive to small perturbations in the data. In lecture three, we saw a method for simulating the sampling of multiple data sets from the source of our original data, which we called bootstrapping. The idea is that we sample with replacement a data set of the same size as the whole data set. We can then repeat our experiment on each bootstrapped sample and use that to get a measure of whether we have high bias or high variance. We can also use bootstrapping as a way to help us build an ensemble. Before we do that, however, let's see why bootstrapping works so well. It's more than just an intuitive trick, and we can make precise exactly how it approximates our data distribution. To make this clear, we'll imagine that we're sampling single scalars from a normal distribution. In that case, we can look at the cumulative density function. For an argument x, this tells us the probability of sampling a point below x. Note that this function returns a probability, not a density. 
it always grows from 0 to 1 over the domain of the probability distribution. The value it returns for x equals minus 1 in this picture is the area under the probability density graph to the left of that value minus 1. And both the cumulative density function and the probability density function uniquely describe the probability distribution. If we sample five points from the original normal distribution and then resample a single point from that data set, we are essentially sampling from the green cumulative distribution function. This is called the empirical distribution, the distribution we get by resampling one point in our data set. To understand this, note that our lowest point is around minus 1.6. So if we resample one of these five points, then below minus 1.6, there is zero probability of seeing any of the points, because none of these five points are in that area. If we move from the left to the right, once we hit minus 1.6, our cumulative density function jumps up to one-fifth, because the probability of seeing a point that is larger than minus 1.6, but smaller than the next highest value, is the probability of hitting exactly the lowest of our five points. And moving further and further to the right, we get this staircase function in five steps. If we sample a larger data set from the original distribution, in this case 50 points, then the empirical cumulative density function becomes a better approximation to the cumulative density function of our data distribution. And if we sample 500 points, the empirical CDF and the original CDF are almost indistinguishable. This is why bootstrapping is often preferred over other resampling methods like cross-validation, because in this way we can show that a bootstrapped sample from a large data set converges to the original data distribution. Bootstrap sampling like this, as we saw before, can help us to measure the bias and variance of a learner, but it can also help us to build an ensemble. Doing so is called bootstrap aggregating or bagging for short. We don't change the way we train the models in our ensemble, but we just feed each of them a bootstrapped sample of our data. This is most often done with classifiers. And in that case, after the ensemble is trained, we simply take a majority vote to get the ensemble prediction. And if we want class probabilities, then we can use the relative frequencies of each class among the predictions of the ensemble. Here's a simple example. We train a set of linear classifiers on bootstrapped samples of our data. Each of them produces a slightly different linear decision boundary, indicated by one of these dotted lines. We can now build an ensemble that looks at what each of these classifiers says and picks the majority class among those predictions. This gives us a piecewise linear decision boundary. Every time two decision boundaries in the ensemble cross, the majority changes. So long as they don't cross, we end up following one of the original linear decision boundaries. A popular way of doing this is with decision trees. And in that case, the method is called random forests. Here, we train a bootstrapped ensemble of decision trees. And for each, we subsample both the instances and the features we include, both the rows and the columns of the data matrix. This is a very simple method that helps a lot to reduce variance requires few hyperparameters to be set, and is easy to parallelize. We do, however, get no reduction of bias. So to summarize, we've looked at ensembling in general and bagging specifically. These are methods that are often used in production and in competitions to achieve an extra boost of performance on top of a particular model. It's important to note that ensembling is almost never used in research because we know we can improve any model by boosting but it doesn't say anything about the model itself. So in machine learning research, where it's important to report on the properties of the model you're presenting, you are providing the model with an unfair advantage by using ensembling. And it's better to compare models in isolation without ensembling. For bigger models, like large deep neural networks, this can be expensive and it's quite rare in production, but in competitions, it does still happen with relatively small ensembles. Now, as we've said before, a method like bagging reduces variance. But what if we know that we have a high bias model and we want to reduce that? Can ensembling help us there? The answer to that is boosting, which we'll look at in the next video.